Good morning, all. Good morning. morning. I want to thank Pastor Kate and Mary and and Becky for their persistence with me as we move towards Sunday, so thank you, ladies, very much. Did you all hear the recent story of the bicyclist who honored his African-American heritage by riding 2,200 miles the route to the Underground, Underground Railroad? He rode about 10 hours a day for several weeks, and on the last day, just, just miles before his goal, somebody stole his bike, and a family lent him a bike to finish the route. Boy, what, what a persistent man. And I'm reminded of the persistence of my three daughters, Elise and Claire and Meredith, and I especially think about Claire today. When she was a preteen, she loved to climb these big trees we have in our backyard, and there was a period of several days where she constructed this elaborate kind of rope pulley system with stair steps up the trees and everything. And I would go outside, I'd say to Tony, I'd say, where's Claire? And she'd point to the tree and smile. And, you know, you can still see the remnants of her work even today. There's a few of those steps way up high, about 40 feet up in the tree. You know, those were good days. And what persistence by Claire. Now, flash forward to this past week in Washington, D.C. Not such good days, would you agree? Did you wonder, as I did, if our country was going to fall off the fiscal cliff or would persistent voices of compromise and reason carry the day? Did you wonder, is anybody out there listening to us out here? You know, this persistence thing is an amazing thing. You've probably heard it said, hey, just do it, just do it. Game on. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Hang in there. That sound familiar to you? Right? We've all said that, kind of nice little sound bites of enthusiasm that we use. And I, I think it says that persistence still matters to us in our culture today, despite the fact that we live in this very instant gratification kind of technological culture. Right? You can ask me a question, and I may not know the answer, but I'm going to Google it on my phone faster than you know what. Right? Um, so even though we can do this, persistence is still the reason that come Monday that my beloved Jayhawks are going to go back out and practice some more. <laughs> it's the reason that my cats chase the mice in the garage, I suppose. It's, uh, it's praying repeatedly for friends and loved ones. It's a child who constantly asks why, 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 why until an answer comes. It's long hours of studying, pursuing maybe a degree or a new job. And it's our returning again and again to worship every Sunday. That's persistence right here. You know, it's all these things, and I tell you, friends, it's nothing new. Imagine the need for a persistent spirit if you were a first century Christian. Those first few generations after Christ's death, those were scary times if you were a Christian. Uh, They were just doing their best to keep the spirit of Christ alive, and I have no doubt that many felt afraid, alone, and, and perhaps even abandoned. Yeah, they must have wondered, is God really listening to their prayers? The message of Christ at that time, it was teetering on the brink. Let's not kid ourselves about that. Would it survive persecution under the Romans or would it be relegated to just another, to the dustbin of history, basically? This morning, I'd like to take a few Google-free moments and reflect with you on Jesus-inspired persistence in that first century and then talk about its role in our lives today in 2013. The Luke Gospel that I read just a few minutes ago is often referred to as the parable of the persistent widow. Uh, Luke inserted this powerful parable in the Gospel for the benefit of an audience that was living around 60 to 75 AD. And think about that time frame, friends. Most of the Christians that were hearing that message or reading about that message, they couldn't really remember Jesus the person. Uh, Only a few, I would suppose, of the surviving older generation maybe knew of Jesus or had known him personally. But most of the church then was the next generation. They were the, the younger folks who were coming along. And, and you know, while they believed the message, they didn't have that firsthand experience with Jesus. And to make matters worse, I, I wonder, uh, perhaps they were tiring of hearing the message uh, that it kept the first generation going strong. And, and here was the message, that Jesus was on his way back, that Jesus was going to come back soon, imminently, and that if they could just hang on and hang in there, He'd be there soon to make everything right. Okay, that was the hope. And the delay must have felt long and kind of unexpected and troubling and questions were asked and I think faith was tested. Where was he? Where was he? 
Biblical scholars point out the parable of the persistent widow was heard by the listeners of the day as kind of an outrageous story. Uh, you know, it was ridiculous. It, it would not have happened. It's, it's symbolic, but it would not have happened. And I want to give you the Reader's Digest version of this story, if I may. All right, let's, let's go back to that Luke story. In the city, there was a narcissistic and corrupt judge and a widow who needed some justice. The widow begged and begged, and so much that the judge got sick and tired of listening to her, and to make her shut up, he gave her what she wanted. Wow, it's kind of stark, isn't it? A little bit harsh. Uh, there were harsh times, especially for women back in those days, uh, especially poor widowed women. Uh, it wasn't a time when everybody had their day in court with Judge Judy. Uh, you know, the woman didn't have any rights. Uh, you know, the, really, the story was a parody. It never would have happened. The closest comparison that we might make in our world today is to think about the plight of women in places like Afghanistan or Pakistan under Taliban oppression. Their females are threatened with death for wanting to do things like go to school or, heaven forbid, drive a car, right? Um, consider that in Jesus' day, let's think about these things. An unmarried woman was not allowed to leave her father's home by herself. A married woman was not allowed to leave her husband's home by herself. Women could not testify in court. They couldn't appear unaccompanied without a man in a public setting or venue. And women were not allowed to talk to strangers. Gals, you're not allowed to talk to strangers. And if you did go out with your husband or with a man, you had to wear two veils. These were, these were very, very painfully repressive times. So the plight of the widow was very dire. So what was Luke's point that he's making in the gospel? Luke was imploring the early followers of Jesus, no matter how disenfranchised and disenchanted they had become, no matter how desperate or disillusioned that they were, to persevere, especially in that prayer relationship with God. Luke was very concerned that they felt God was not listening, that interaction with God had really ceased, that there was nothing, game over, nada. So in the parable, even the secular unjust judge who didn't fear God, didn't care for the poor, finally listened to the poor but persistent widow. And if that is possible, certainly God who is God and who cares greatly for us, for God's people, is going to hear our prayers. Trust in God. Hang in there. Don't give up the faith. Now, the second Timothy scripture tracks along a similar time frame as the Luke parable. Uh, Timothy was probably the best known of the Apostle Paul's associates. And scholars know the letter was not really written by Paul to Timothy. Uh, it was written in his name. Paul was long since uh, deceased. But the letter suggests that Timothy had a tough preaching gig back in those days. He was facing stiff competition from other teachers who were poised to lead Christians in other directions to kind of break things up. Uh, so this was considered really a, a huge fly in the Christian ointment that, they, that Timothy really had to be strong about. And, and I want to repeat, if I could, for you, a, a very powerful portion of that 2 Timothy reading that I think we can all relate to. Let me give it to you here, if I could. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and they'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myth and story. Would we ever do that? Would we ever do that? <laughs> Surround ourselves with only the voices we want to hear and not those we need to hear. You, you ever sought out a yes person? Um, imagine me talking to my dear wife, Tony. I said, Tony, isn't it true that triple chocolate delight ice cream is good for me? <laughs> and she would say, yes, Jonathan, it is. And I would say, thank you. Or how about, do you like my tie? And she'd say, I love your tie. Isn't that nice? Ah, yes, people, they make us feel so good, at least for a while, but only, only for a while. Not, not really feel good. And we've all, we've all had those kind of itchy ears, just, you know, tell me what I want to hear and don't tell me anything I don't want to hear. Even with our, I think about our kids, and I, I know there were times when our kids were growing up that they had itchy ears, that some of their friends who maybe weren't such nice friends uh, were, were talking to them, and when we would prefer that they would talk with uh, Tony and me instead. Now, let's move forward. Clearly, the place of Christianity in the modern world has changed since the first century. I would suggest to you that the role of persistence has not changed. And I think Tony pointed that out in the children's sermon this morning. Each of us still faces significant challenges, friends, in our lives, whether it's individual lives, family lives, community functioning. 
You know, Luke was, was writing and preaching to people who were discouraged and persecuted and marginalized, and some of you today may feel exactly that in your life right now. Timothy was trying to corral people who had stopped listening to the gospel message and were distracted in their faith. Haven't we been distracted in our faith sometimes? Um, lost, maybe tempted, maybe uncertain. Where are we headed? We have all been in those places. And as it is said, faithful persistence and perseverance is much uh, in need today under what they call that favorable and unfavorable times, rain or shine, we need, to, we need to have our faith. No matter how rough it gets, it's important to keep on praying no matter what. Whether it's a corrupt judge or a politician in D.C. or uh, uh, tall trees that need to be climbed or bike rides that need to be done, God will be with us. Eugene Peterson in the message says this, you're going to find there will be times when people will have no stomach for solid teaching, but will fill up on spiritual junk food, catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. They'll turn their backs on truth and chase mirages. Keep your eye on what you're doing. Accept the hard times along with the good. Keep the message alive. So then, what's the pathway of persistence? What's it look like? Yeah, you know, where does it lead? I don't think there's any one answer to that, and I, it would be presumptive if I said that there was. To my daughter Claire, persistence led up a tree. To Abraham Lincoln, it led eventually to the White House. Today's scripture says it begins with prayer, and not blank check kind of prayer, where we just give God our wish list and he kind of fills it out. And it's also not what we call tow truck theology. You know what that is? That's where you pray to God like he's a tow truck driver, that when you get in the ditch of life, you pray that he shows up and kind of gets you out of the ditch, and then you wave him away and say thanks. That's not what we're talking about. Um, what we're talking about is the fact that God is the parent and we are the kids, and that means that we belong to God. And the widow Ah, she's the ultimate child of God, and she's also our teacher. She keeps calling and trusting despite the fact that things seem pretty hopeless. But she believes, and what she believes is the psalm that Andy sang for us. She believes this, that God will always be with her and us. God does not slumber nor sleep. God always watches over us, our going out and our coming in. Frederick Buchner is a longtime Presbyterian minister and author. Some of you probably know that name. He wrote, Persistence is key not because you have to beat a path to God's door before God will open it, but because until you beat the path, there's no way of getting to the door. All right. Now, we are a church that believes equally in the prayer path and the mission path. As we heard last Sunday, we were talking a lot about mission. And I come by the mission path honestly. You know, some of you may know that my father, uh, Cliff Higgins, is a retired UCC pastor, lives up in Lincoln, Nebraska. And Dad became aware, aware about two years ago that the city mission in the heart of Lincoln, Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska is a nice town, folks. If you've not been there, it's just a beautiful city. But the city mission had no paved road to the front door of the facility. It was a muddy mess. Every time it rained, the volunteers and people who were using the mission had to walk through muddy paths to get to the door of the mission. And he became incensed by this. He went home one night and he said, he said you know, I can, I can turn on the Huskers and watch or I can do something. So dad wrote a letter to the editor of the newspaper and he decided to go to the next city council meeting, the Lincoln City Council, and then he showed up again and then he wrote more letters and then somebody did an interview with him and, and you know, one thing led to another and I think what happened is the city council got tired of him showing up <laughs> and they said, fine, Clip, would you just shut up already? We will vote to pay for the road to get paved to the city mission. There it is. So friends, how will we handle opportunities for persistence, for tree climbing, for bike riding, for prayer time, for mission time? Really, it's a, it's a pretty basic question. Will we persist or will we not? With God's ever-present help, persistence changes us and it brings change to other people. And, and the real beauty of today's scripture, if you were listening carefully, that we are persistent with God and God is persistent with us. It works both ways. God has not given up on us even when we act like we're the judge and we forget God or maybe we don't fear God or love God as we should. God has not given up on us. There is hope not only for the widow, for disenfranchised and persecuted women, the people in the Lincoln City Mission, but for you and me. God has work for us to do. 
We belong to God and we are called to persistently offer all that we have and everything we are. We need to open the door of our heart to those who knock upon it persistently, bringing relief and justice to the world. Behold, says the Christ, I stand at the door and knock. Let's open it, not just once or twice, but persistently, allowing the great Jehovah to guide our hands and feet in the service of Christ. Amen.